All financial support for this podcast comes from my patrons on patreon.com. If you'd like to join in with the patrons, please check out patreon.com slash Darwin Gross. That's D-A-R-W-I-N-G-R-O-S-S-E. Now enjoy the podcast. Okay, today I get, I have the great opportunity to talk to somebody that was actually introduced to me by uh, this person's publicist. Uh, his name's Roger Neal, and uh, as I as I got the info, and the more I learned out learned about him, the more intrigued I was. I mean, quite frankly, it was pretty intriguing to find out that he and I and my birthday are the same day. So that was a great start. Uh, yeah. I I knew there was going to be some alignment, but. Um, as I went through his body of work, I was really pretty blown away. And so um, I'm very excited to get a chance to talk to Roger Neal. Hey, Roger, how's it going? Hey, great. Good to, good to talk to you. Uh, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to have this chat. I really appreciate it. Um, for people who might not be uh, aware of your work, why don't we start off by having you talk a little bit about uh, what you're currently working on and kind of what your body of work represents. Oh, great. Yeah, well, I'm a composer. I'm a um, film composer, primarily film, television, games. Um, uh, most recently, I had a film come out this month called uh, Valley Girl. Uh, some of my more well-known projects include the film 20th Century Women and Beginners, those Academy Award winning films, although not for me, mm -hmm. uh, but great films. The TV series Mozart in the Jungle, the animated series King of the Hill, and many others. Um, I've been doing this for... Uh, number of decades now <laughs> yeah you, you have you have quite a quite a body of work indeed uh i was lucky enough to like uh stumble across your sound count page and it's kind of a neat compendium of a lot of your work now one of the things i thought was interesting was that you seem to be super adept at kind of like latching on to any sort of stylistic thing and really bringing it home in a pretty uh in a pretty straightforward way so like whether it's sort of 70s late 70s synth poppy kind of stuff or ethereal ambient or especially one of the things uh i noticed was that you have done some scoring work for uh, a recent set of animations on adult swim by jj villard and, yeah. Uh, man, fun. listening to that, that seemed like every 20 seconds there was a completely different musical style, right? Um, yeah. What, tell me a little bit about how you feel about working in that kind of thing and, and sort of like having to embrace the, you know, styles on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. Well, it's a tricky thing about being a film composer because you, it, you, you need to be in some ways a scholar of of uh, music genres, just because you you want to be able to have access to the sounds that are appropriate to any any moment or any storyline that, that you're going to be uh, involved with, and it's um, you're more likely to have a thriving career if you if you can sort of put, put on a number of different identities as a composer. Um, sometimes I liken it to being like a character actor right. uh, who can play a lot of different kind of roles, but always hopefully has that one. Thing about them that makes them interesting in every role. You know, someone like a Gary Oldman or Willem Dafoe, that kind of character actor. They're always themselves, but they also bring <laughs> something so unique. And you can right. see those guys, you know, in period pieces and, and different, you know, identities. And so if, as a film composer, it's kind of a similarity because you kind of need to be able to, to put on these different kind of identities, but also um, hopefully have your own voice. You know, and that's kind of it's kind of a tricky thing. I think that's kind of a thing that a lot of us composers strive for. Now, with JJ Villar's Fairy Tales, that was we kind of took advantage of that because JJ is is, um, is a nut, and he's always like kind of like bouncing around tonally and stylistically with his with his animation and the storytelling. So we're always like every twenty seconds changing to like some other right. reference or some other kind of sound. You yeah. Know? So. Um, so you know, we sort of like take advantage of just like the the different uh, the different tools in the toolbox. Sure. Is there is there any style that you particularly feel at home with, and conversely, any style that is really particularly hard for you? <laughs> well, I'm a sort of 
conventionally trained classical musician on one hand. And the other hand, like I'm a, I'm a, I'm a guitarist. I'm like a sort of pop music guy, record producer, songwriter. And I have that sensibility as well. So, um, that helps me sort of helps me kind of mix it up and, and, and sort of like make sort of a, an arsenal of, of uh, abilities that I can use for, for whatever it comes across. Now, occasionally might be times when I'm asked to do something that's stylistically uh, specific, which is not in my wheelhouse. Mm-hmm. But sometimes that actually gets really interesting results. Like, for example, this hasn't happened, but let's say uh, I was asked to do a soundtrack for a film in the style of Drake. I wouldn't be the first call for that, but let's say someone called me. <laughs> I probably wouldn't be able to pull that off effectively if that was really the intention. But on my journey to try to sound like Drake, I would probably come up with something at least unusual sounding right. <laughs> that might sure. really be, you know, the best result. Yeah, that makes so. a lot of sense, right? You know, there's all kinds of questions about sort of the mechanics of doing film composition, and I'm sure that every project is different. But how often? How often do you find yourself in a position of working with film directors or animation directors or whatever, where they kind of fancy themselves musicians a bit as well, and so they end up being really involved in the scoring process? Yeah, um, that does happen. There's um, kind of a stock reply from composers generally, like I... I, I will talk to my my composing colleagues and we'll share, you know, war stories about... Tips and tricks, stuff, right? Yeah, wrong. sure. <laughs> <laughs> so this one comes up a lot, and um, there's sort of a cliche of some, with some truth to it, which is that um, the most dangerous director or producer is someone who has a little bit of music knowledge, because with a little bit, they know exactly how to ask you the wrong questions and to direct yeah. you in the wrong way. Okay. But really, that... Um, for the most part, I feel like it's my job in, uh, as, a, as a film composer, as a, as a collaborative storyteller, to find a way to really communicate with the director. I mean, I'm, in the, I'm inviting them into my field. Uh-huh. And so sometimes they may say things which may be questionable, and I will you know, hopefully find a way to, um, to the help define what they're looking, looking for. Or even if they have no idea what kind of words to use to talk with me about music, I will help them sort of find a way to speak in, in a way that gets me to write the music that they're looking for. They have something right. in mind. They have to trust the fact that they have something in mind um, that they, and that they're um, on a journey that you're trying to help them complete. But I do have, have had some directors who really love hanging out with me in my studio and will almost to the point of writing the score with me, sitting next to me. Uh, when that works well, it works really well, mm-hmm. um, except it goes a little bit slower. But it's like that, it's really good. Um, one director who I've worked with quite a lot, who I respect quite a lot, is Mike Mills, who directed me in 20th Century Women and a number of other projects. And he's a, he's a pretty good amateur musician, but he um, has a very strange ear. So I'll be, he'll, and he'll, he's the guy that will sit right next to me in the studio as I'm writing things when he has the time to do so. Mm-hmm. What he does, which drives me nuts, is um, I'll write something, let's say, let's say it's a piano piece. And it's kind of somewhat interesting, except it has one particular cool melodic gesture, let's say. He will love it, except for the one cool melodic gesture. <laughs> maybe, maybe take that out. So I end up with... I end up by taking everything out that's interesting. <laughs> um, and then I'm forced to make these decisions musically that I wouldn't otherwise make myself. Like, I, w- I would definitely, like, not take out that cool part. But the results are surprisingly really fascinating because I end up with a finished composition, which is put together by choices I wouldn't have otherwise made. But this, but at the end of the day, somehow I have to make it all work. And by, by adhering to his ear it works in an interesting way in a new way a fresh way that's you know unlike anything i would normally do and so so certain directors i work with where the music i write with them is different from any other music I write with anybody else because i'm i'm following their instincts you know right. their biases and their prejudices and um and i like that I, I like that kind of collaboration a lot that's cool so <laughs> i i I already have about a million questions, but before we get burning into that, um, one of the things that's kind of a hallmark of the of this podcast is talking to people about their beginning stories, how they got to be the artists that they are. 
And I'm particularly curious about yours, again, because you do have to have this really broad range of knowledge of musical study. But again, listening to your work, there's clearly some really well-studied classical background in there as well. So I'm curious to know a little bit more about your background. You know, growing up, were you like a band kid or a piano lesson kid? How did you move into uh, into the kind of the doing the compositional thing? What was the thing that tipped you into composition versus performance? I, I'm curious about those those kinds of stories. Could you fill me yeah, in a wow. little bit on that? Sure. Boy, that's going to go way back. But uh, this, <laughs> <laughs> there is an answer to your question. I've been a musician since I was a kid. I think um, probably from about really like age nine or 10, it was clear that I was dedicated to be a musician and that I was going to be a musician and that was my thing. There never was a plan B. <laughs> you know, like I think like a lot of us, uh, particularly in that era, I, I got in this, I started playing first instruments in school. And I say in that era, because I don't think the school music programs exist anymore. that right. got me into music, right. sadly. I always loved music a lot. Even as a little kid, I had an older sister with a great record collection. Um, so I was listening to pretty advanced, like, you know, progressive rock and stuff like that when I was six or seven years old. Uh, first instrument I started to play when I was in, was in elementary school was, was the flute. I got pretty good at it right away. And, and um, like kind of like right away, like within a few months of learning how to play this instrument, I started writing things down because there was something to be some, notate, some notation paper in my house somewhere for some reason. And I just assumed everybody did that, you know. Um, I was just like toot some notes and, and uh, start writing them down. Well, it turns out perhaps everybody didn't do that, but I was doing that at age 10. So, um, that led to um, me getting some lessons on uh, in piano and in, comp- in uh, composition from like um, the guy down the street who played piano, like that kind of teacher. Sure. Um, but it turns out the guy down the street who played piano was a tremendous, tremendous musician who uh, was a big influence on me. His name is Francis Stum, and I mentioned him because he was uh, such a, a huge um, influence on, on my development as, as a musician. This is in San Diego, my hometown. And Francis would teach me Beethoven and Stravinsky, and we'd hang out at his at his house and listen to records, and we'd listen to anything from like Stockhausen to Zappa to uh, John Lennon, and talk about music. It was just a, a wide, universe-expanding experience to study with that guy for my, my formative years. Kind of what age range? What age range was this? I'm sorry. What age range uh, was 12 this? Twelve, uh, twelve to fifteen or so. Oh wow! Okay. Um, I was going to say this one last thing about Francis. His, his best pal was this young piano playing um, uh, folk musician from San Diego who would hang out at my lessons waiting for Francis to get done so they can go out and carouse. And uh, that was Tom Waits <laughs> uh, be- before his first record even came out. Actually, his first record came out and he would he would hang out at my, at my piano lessons. By the way, I just want to finish the story about Francis is that um, decades later when my own um, nephew who lives in, lives in San Diego wanted to take lessons, um, you hooked him up with Francis, and so though that storyline continues. So he right. ended up being an influence on the members of my family. That's so cool. That's amazing. But also, it's really interesting to hear um, of your you kind of being able to get your ears opened when you're in that twelve to fifteen year old range. I mean, so often people, you know, their their first interaction with Stockhausen, for example. Uh, doesn't really take place until university, so you kind of got almost a a jump on that whole that whole edge of things. Yeah, I did, and that was, and I'm very feel very fortunate to have that. But I was listening to everything, you know. I think a lot of musicians and and young musicians do that. Hopefully, they do. I mean, I was listening to my parents' big band albums and um, jazz records and uh, classical guitar stuff and just any anything that caught my interest and um, you know, that sort of expansive hunger for all types of music, I think is what really ultimately pushed me to being a film composer Mm -hmm. because um, you get the chance, like we started this conversation, you get the chance to bounce around in different genres, different identities. If I was either a conventional recording artist or a classical type composer, I might not have the chance to write, say, something in the style of 1979 synth pop, 
Right. Uh, but because it's like, well, why would I do that? Even though I, you know, even, well, not that I, why would I do that? But just be like, um, it just wouldn't come up, I suppose. But the film composing, you, you, you get to do that. You know, you get to put on these, these different, uh, different guises. And then that's kind of seemed like a great fit for me. Sure. So what was your, what was your education then once you went to university? Cause it sounds to me like you have a, I mean, you mentioned that you have this kind of very classical music education. What, what did that look like? Well, yeah, you know, when I was, um, when I was a young, younger kid, I was playing classical music and I was playing in new symphonies. But then when I reached adolescence, I realized, um, playing the flute really wasn't going to get me any dates. So, um, <laughs> I started playing, <laughs> playing guitar. Like the reason I most, you know, most guys join bands to try to get a date and right. usually it doesn't work out that they right. get into a band anyway. Right. Um, at least that was my case. So, <laughs> you know, like around, um, uh, age 12 or so, I started playing guitar and got good enough to gig. You know, I was a good rock musician. I was a good classical musician. Good enough. Not great, but good enough. Eventually I wanted to go to college and study music. And I, I realized that, uh, or acknowledged the flute was still my strongest instrument. I was still most proficient on that. So I, I applied to a number of music schools and got accepted to USC as a flute player. Um, I got there and found out I was one of about 43 flute players in the school. And I was about the 41st best flute player at the school. <laughs> <laughs> but what I was really good at was my theory class. So my, my theory teacher said, you're in the wrong department. Come join composition. Mm. They, made a position, they made a place for me there, and I studied composition at USC, which worked out great. And, uh, and I, followed, I kept on that path. I, I got my composition degree from them. Then a chance meeting with a professor at Harvard. This is at the Aspen School of Music. Uh, I spent a summer there, and I met this Harvard professor who liked my music, and just out of the blue said, what are you doing next year? And I go, oh, nothing. I'm finishing up USC. I have no idea. And he said, well, come to Harvard. That was my application process. So I got accepted to Harvard Graduate School. Easiest thing in the world. I mean, it was like, yeah, I just right. fell in my lap. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I really had no intention of going to school. I just like, you know, you're a musician with a degree and no, no real marketable skills. So I thought, well, Sure. <laughs> better than a better than being a typist right um yeah. so yeah so i got a, i i went the whole um whole journey on that and um got a phd in music composition from harvard and that was in some respects the trajectory i was on i was kind of thinking i'd probably end up being a professor right uh however i was i was already writing film scores i'd done stuff at usc as a as a student and one of my um pals at USC. He was a filmmaker, ended up making his first film, feature film, which I scored while I was living in Cambridge using musicians. And we recorded the score in a dining hall at Harvard. So I was already interested in that. But what happened, what really got me in, into being a, a composer that works for a living is, is this. When I was in grad school, I started to f realize that I could apply for grants and fellowships and things and probably get them because, you know, you get this credential, uh, this Harvard mm -hmm. credential, that just kind of right. like throws away. That's kind of, if it's, if it's for anything, it's yeah. for that. <laughs> so, uh, right. <laughs> it works pretty well. Uh, so I, I applied for this, um, a new fellowship out of BMI, BMI, the Performing Rights Organization. Right. And it was called the Pete Carpenter Fellowship. It was a fellowship designed to bring conservatory or non-Hollywood young composers to Hollywood to learn about the film music business and the film music business to learn about them. Okay. So I received, I applied for and received this fellowship. I think I was the second person to get it and it's still in existence today. BMI still offers this fellowship. So I got this thing and I um, left school for six weeks and came out to Los Angeles and, um, worked with a bunch of different composers. I worked with them, just like looked over the shoulders of a bunch of different composers. Okay. Uh, Michael Kamen, Quincy Jones, uh, Mark Mother's Boss, and you know, terrific people. Wow. And this, this sponsor of this fellowship is the TV composer, Mike Post. He set it up actually in honor mm. of his late partner, Pete, Car Pete Carpenter. Okay. <clears throat> so through this, I got to know Mike really well, and uh, he liked me. And basically said, so when you're done with Harvard, what are you doing next? I said, I don't know. You know well, why do you ask? 
and he offered me a job to come work with him. So that's how um, that was my connection to work in Hollywood. That is so interesting, but it also, uh, it, you know, it, it helps me understand uh, a little bit about how the that mechanism works. I mean, it's it's really. Every time I talk to somebody who's who sort of like makes a makes a career in Hollywood, it always has that kind of feeling to it. Like, um, <clears throat> you know, I was I was studying, I was working hard. I happened to find myself in L.A. working with X, and mm-hmm. we hit it off, and that became uh, and and that's how I kind of got started in the business, right? It, it seems like sort of this kind of personal connection is really one of the hallmarks of what what uh, breaks things open for people working in Hollywood. Is it, I mean, beyond yourself, is that sort of something that you tend to see in, in general in the case of film com- composition? Yeah, yeah. I, I think about this quite a lot because I have younger composers who find me and seek me out and some, some of who become... I become a mentor for, and we, you know, I, I do a lot of advising on, on film career, how to develop a career. And um, first thing I usually say is, don't follow my example because mine is just, mine just, <laughs> it just kind of <laughs> fell on my lap. I didn't do anything. <laughs> uh, it's just like you know, right? Uh, I'm a little glib, but not really. You know, one thing I have found to be true for a lot of people, and not just in music, but in all sorts of fields, is the people who end up being important to you, to helping you get your start, uh, helping you do your first, you know, first important projects are not, it's not like you break into Hollywood and meet these famous people. The people you end up being important to you are the people you already know for the most part, like people that you've grown up with, perhaps, even if you grew up nowhere. And I grew up in San Diego, which, you know, as far as Hollywood is concerned is nowhere. Right. Um, but a lot of people who I just sort of like came up with and um, spent my childhood with end up being super important to um, opportunities that came my way later. And uh, some, in some cases became collaborators with me in some cases, just people who uh, helped me find other people mm-hmm. that um, were important to me. I say this because I think I, I find this to be true. And I, and I think it's a, uh, it's turned out to be valuable to people who I've um, shared this information with, because it can be really daunting as a young composer trying to figure out how to get a toehold, right? You know, in the business. And uh, again, it's not a matter of like, how can I meet this other person? And how can I meet you know so and so famous director or whatever they're trying to do? That's not where your career is going to start. Your career is going to start with like the guys you already know, people you already know. Hopefully, one of them might want to be a filmmaker or something, or maybe your um, you know relative knows somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who needs music mm-hmm. for something. Right. Um, that that more often than not is the way that this uh i think that people get those important first opportunities well and also this idea of people you know i mean you say that you came from uh san diego which is sort of like hollywood nowhere but also i mean you studied at usc and in fact it's kind of funny that you were at usc and then booked it all the way over to massachusetts to eventually mm. get the opportunity to come back to Los Angeles and work, you know, <laughs> yes. it's kind of interesting, but I mean, in your time in USC, did you build up kind of connections with people that ended up becoming important? Oddly less than you might think. Really? Um, oh, that's, that's wild. I mean, I will say the USC school of music is just outstanding. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was great. You know, I, I learned more practical skills there than anywhere including Harvard in a way, Harvard is, is a, is a deeper dive into, uh, you know, academic studies of music. And I right. loved it. I loved it for itself. I loved it as, a, as just an endeavor in its, in its own. But <laughs> when I, once I started working like as a film composer, I kind of realized this is a little, little glib, but I think it's true. I kind of realized that I already had all the skills at about age 17 that I needed to do this <laughs> film composing thing. <laughs> Everything else was just uh, gravy. So, USC ended up not being the place where I met lots of people who ended up being important career connections. I just learned, I just met lots of great musicians who helped sure. me um, become, you know, a become better. I could right. be. Yeah. 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 Now, um, I'm curious uh, when you moved out to LA and you started uh, working 
you know, kind of in a, uh, mentee role with, with Mike Post in some way. Um, what is, what are the things that he taught you or the, the group of people surrounding him taught you that, uh, proved to be valuable in kind of turning this from a cool opportunity into a career? Because that must, I mean, you obviously, you obviously, uh, <laughs> it obviously worked out for you. So you must have like gotten some good, good hints out of that first experience. Well, yeah. And Mike, meeting Mike was a great, uh, good fortune for me. And he's a, he's a super guy. And we're still friends to this day. When he, when he offered me that job uh, to come work with him, neither he nor I really knew what that job would be. He just mm. thought, you know, maybe this. Roger guy has something going on. <laughs> and uh, when I when I arrived at his at the studio and started working the first few weeks, he, he realized I had a pretty firm background in like the, in computers and MIDI and and electronic music. And a lot of this was new. This is we're talking about the mid nineties. Okay. So this is fairly new technology, and he, and the fact that I knew this stuff would ended up being surprisingly valuable to him. He had no mm-hmm. idea. What happened at Mike's shop? It's interesting to me. He has this, he was super busy with like you know five six different TV series, and he got one of his main producers, um, his pal Stephen Cannell, had an one late night action series that Mike did not want to score. He thought it was crappy, and but he took the job and gave it to uh, to me and his other assistant Danny Lux to score. It was a TV series called Silk Stockings. <laughs> and so Danny and I are scoring scoring the series. This is really like two weeks after I arrived in Los Angeles. Wow. I'm scoring the TV series with my name on the on the screen, me and Danny's name on the screen. It just like just stuff just, just like fell on my lap. It was so simple, which is why I tell people don't follow my example. Right. It won't happen. Yeah, this week. it won't. Yeah. But Dan, but to answer your question about Mike, though, here's here's the thing that's so valuable is is really part of the learning process for some composers is not. It's not so much like the, the notes you choose or how to write music. With Mike, it was two things: how to understand storytelling, which is a really you know intricate craft in itself, and also simply how to run a business as a as an artist. Specifically, how to um, interact with your um, collaborative clients and uh, foster those relationships and just be part of a team of uh, filmmakers or TV show makers. You're part of this greater idea and just how to be, how to be, how to fulfill your role in a way that's really valuable. Those are some of the things I learned um, from those early years. Well, I would like to know a little bit more of those because they're, uh, those are both like really intriguing things, but they're both kind of different qualities of like the creative pursuit, right? So um, let's start off, first of all, with the storytelling. What, what exactly do you mean by storytelling when it comes to film scoring? What, what exactly are you, are you kind of talking about? Um, why is the music there? We can start with that. When you kind of think about it, why does film music exist at all? It seems fairly arbitrary. Like, why, why is there music going on while we're flying this spaceship through you know an asteroid belt. I mean, mm-hmm. it it works, but it seems like kind of you know why is there's orchestral music playing? <laughs> um, well, hopefully it's there because it helps it helps enhance the story. It helps it tell, it makes it more vivid. It tells something that's otherwise wouldn't be um, part of the experience for the audience. And uh, specifically, like you can get this fix, like you, you can enhance like the moments, like when are we in peril? When is there a release of that peril? When, uh, when are we winning? When are we losing? Uh, what does that, what does that little crook of his eye mean at that point? These are all stuff that can be really so sort of defined and enhanced by the music in ways that even I think um, some music aficionados don't always really appreciate, like how intricate it all works. When I'm working on a new score, for a film, it really is a part of the process for me is really trying to figure out who the characters are, what makes them tick, what if, what's their journey, what do they know now that they don't know later, when they learn this thing, you know, how how do they evolve, how does this character relate to that character, because that's going to that's going to determine what kind of music I write for these two people. If they're together in the same scene, there might be an, um, a power dynamic that needs to be um, acknowledged. In some way, so these like all these kind of intricacies about the about the storytelling become super important to my 
to my musical choices. Right. And that becomes just like the, the fun thing when I'm talking with my directors and the people I'm working with to get into that. Uh, let's not talk about whether it's a B flat, whether it's on a bassoon. <laughs> let's talk about, you know, what is she thinking right here? Right. What is, uh, what's her thought process at this moment? And then 10 seconds later, what, what's different? That's helpful. That's interesting uh, for me as a composer. That's that's so cool, and that's it. Really, kind of like breaks away from uh, so much of what I think people imagine is the art. You know, the quote art of uh, film composing, which is like, you know, I think a lot of people get overly impressed by like the orchestration, or maybe the uh, you know the the complexity or the the. Uh, you know, what kind of chordal movement there is. And really what you're saying is look at the screen. Um, what, how can you enhance what's on the screen so that the story is told in a more, well, you use the word vivid. It, how can the story be told in a more vivid way? And that, that really seems to be a, a very interesting approach to take. Yeah. You know, <laughs> You have to justify your existence too. So, uh, <laughs> as, as a composer, why, you know, why am I even here? Right. Uh, and I tell you, it's really, it's really gratifying when you play something, a piece you've written for your, your director, and their story becomes more vivid for them. You mm -hmm. know, and they just like they're moved by it, or oh, they're cool. um, delighted by it. That's that's really gratifying. You know, because you feel like now, okay, I've, I've um, justified my existence. Right. Sure. That makes a lot of sense. Now, the other thing that you mentioned that, that Mike kind of taught you was the how to run the business aspect of it. And I think that this is something that's really important because a lot of times when you, especially when I talk to people who are just kind of getting started in the business or whatever, um, they're confronted with a lot of business questions that their time at Berkeley or their time at Cal Arts or their time at Harvard or wherever didn't prepare them to ask like you know uh, hey are you gonna you know can you work work on this for free for quote exposure right or mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> you know you're going to ghostwrite for somebody else because that's what we need to do in order to get the funding for a job or something like that. How much of that uh, kind of came into play, and and what were like the warning tracks that that might have been uh, illuminated for you? First of all, you know, first of all, we're talking about the business side. Uh, I'm not simply talking about how to enhance your money flow, but also just right. much broader things like how to uh, foster a career, how to uh, manage your factory so that you're outputting your your work in a way that you know where you're dependable and and uh, it's uh, it's good quality and all these other factors. It's just you know like any any other shop you might be I might be running <laughs> right my uh, custom upholstery shop or whatever yeah, whatever it might right. be metalworking or whatever yeah uh, sure you know as, as you've learned I spent a lot of time in conservatory so I I do feel like the conservators conservatories generally do a poor job of training their students in how to make a career happen. And I think that's a disservice, um, a real disservice in the, in, in the teaching I do. Um, I'm, I'm cognizant of that. And I really try to, um, to push against that because it, first of all, it's irresponsible <laughs> to teach people about music and not teach them how to make a, a career happen with that music. But also I think from younger musicians who feel somewhat idealistic, they might think business is anti-ethical to, to music, but it's not insofar as when I study the, the lives of whether it's famous composers or even famous pop stars, their lives are also, their choices, their artistic choices are rooted to their desire to make a name for themselves and to do their work. Beethoven was a fine business person and he would plan his own concerts and sell subscription tickets himself, sometimes at the door, and write particular pieces for a particular concert in order to make um, money for himself. He'd be in charge of the advertising. People I don't, aren't, they aren't really aware of this, I think, um, but it's absolutely true. The Bach Brandenburg Concertos were written as a demo for Bach to get a gig with um, Frederick the Great. They are demos to get a job, <laughs> which, is, which he did not get. But thank God we got the demos because they're, right. they're amazing. So even things like that, even something this is, a, I think also this is a left turn, but 
Keith Richard, when he wrote Satisfaction, he came up with that great fuzz bass, a fuzz um, guitar part, dum ba 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 bum ba da 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 da, which he played on the fuzz guitar because he really wanted a horn section, but they didn't have the bucks for it. So we find a way to uh, to make it work with what the resources they had as a business decision. Um, I mean, what a less good song Satisfaction would be if that was if a it was horn section, section right? <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> That's so, uh, I don't know. So it's just yeah. these are sort of just type of stuff that you learn along the way, like yeah. how to make it all work. And and sometimes you you also learn that your uh, limitations end up being the things that send you in in a really good journey somewhere. Right. Now, one of the things I want I'm really uh, I wanted to explore a little further was something that you said, which is that um, one of the things that's that's neat about doing film, being a film composer, is that it actually lets you explore musical styles that you probably wouldn't be able to do if you were a, you know, quote, recording musician. And I think that this is, you know, it, it's something that for people who want, who love a lot of different kinds of music, it actually is a conundrum. You know, it's like, uh, you know, hey, I'm known for doing ambient music, but I really like banging on an MPC drum machine and doing beats. But nobody wants to hear my beats, right? Everyone wants to hear my ambient music. Uh, where you have the opportunity, you know, it's funny. I was listening to different things and like uh, the 20th century movie. Uh, I, I'm terrible. 20th, 20th century woman. In 20th yeah, century right. woman, I mean, you did all of these kind of like gauzy synthy tracks, which were just like, I mean, kind of really sounded of an era. And then, uh, you mm -hmm. know, a bunch of stuff that you did for uh, Valley Girl kind of had uh, more of this like really poppy thing. But then I ran yeah. across something called the Beastly Bombing, which is oh, like, yeah. which is like almost... Uh, vaudevillian in nature in some cases you've got some stuff yeah. where it's like solo piano other stuff where it's outright jazz it must be kind of it must be kind of fun i guess to be able to like dig into a genre and then just really express yourself you know kind of temporarily right wow you found the beastly bombing um so, so that's <laughs> for you that was that yeah, was funny crazy. because that was something when I saw it, I was like, wow, this is a very polarizing piece because it seemed like people oh, yeah. either absolutely loved it. I think you won an award for that, right? Yeah. And then yeah, other people the, just were like, the they, they just wanted to crucify you for it. So it's pretty yeah. interesting thing. Thank God. <laughs> we like those people a lot. Yeah. Um, that was, we were intentionally trying to write it. It was an, it's an opera. It's a musical. Uh -huh. um, and it was a musically stylistic it, we're trying to be in the style of Gilbert and Sullivan, late 19th century British operettas. Mm -hmm. But the story has to do with white supremacists and Al-Qaeda Al terrorists and, and uh, a bunch of hijinks and, uh, <laughs> and uh, the destruction of um, the country with nuclear bombs. And, and it's all good fun. So, but that, but that, I mean, thank you for mentioning that because that does sort of illustrate my point. I really was given a chance to write music in the style of Gilbert and Sullivan which, when would that otherwise come around? Right. You know, it's yeah. like I don't. It's not like I'd wake up one morning and say, "I'm going to sing it right. I'm going to write something that's going to sound. It's going to sound like the Pirates of Penzance." No, um, not unless I have a reason to. <laughs> and I found a reason. I had my um, a friend of mine, a very talented writer, Julian Nitzberg, wrote this. Had this concept for a musical, and he, he brought it to me, and I said, "Yeah, I'm on board." So I wrote this thing, and it's like, it's in this this very specific genre style, uh -huh. and. Um, and yeah, and for that, you know, as I was writing that, I took on that character of that composer who would write this style. And that was fun. That's so cool. I'm sorry, you had a question somewhere. In there oh, yeah, which, well, I don't care because we just like all of a sudden took a left turn into doing a Gilbert and Sullivan piece, which is like pretty fascinating. So unfortunately, our time is up already. But before I let you go, um, I am curious, what is a thing that you haven't gotten a chance to do? that you really want to do? I mean, do you want to do a score that is in the style of Drake or is there, is there something that you're like really dying to do that you haven't done yet? Wow. Good question. I'll try to answer this way. I love it when people ask me to write music that I have no idea how to write. So whether it's to write like Drake or to write like, um, <sighs> Indonesian folk music, I'm up for that challenge. That's mm -hmm. super fun. Cool. Um, 
But also, I think um, the classical musician of me, I think I like nothing more than when I'm in front of an orchestra at a, at a scoring stage, big, giant, fat orchestra, conducting that that glorious sound. I've done that, but I just like doing that and want to do more of it. And that's really, in some ways, um, the pinnacle, I think, of uh, when I feel like I'm doing my career to the fullest when I'm doing this big orchestral right. scores and big orchestral recording sessions. Right on. Um, what, what do you have coming up that people can uh, look forward to checking out? I'm working on two films now. I don't know when they're released. Um, one is called Unpregnant, and it's for HBO Max. It's the same director that directed Valley Girl, okay. uh, Rachel Goldenberg, and she's going to come to my studio in about 10 minutes to listen to my latest cues. Uh, they'll come out sometime next few months. Another film called Alex October, which is a uh, independent drama. And I don't know when that'll come out, but both will probably be out sometime later this year or early 2021. That's fantastic. And one last thing um, you mentioned that uh, you actually said, you know, the teaching I do dot, 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 what kind of, what kind of teaching do you do? How do you, how do you kind of fulfill that part of your interests? I love teaching. I uh, was teaching at UCLA and teaching at Cal Poly Pomona at certain points in my life. No, not at the moment. Um, as I kind of teach and then I kind of get tired of it and right. I have to be recharged and come back. But I do, I do this one thing, which is a, every summer there's a, um, a workshop I teach called the Palomar Film Music Workshop. Myself and my colleague, Larry Goupe. It's a nine-day workshop in San Diego, San Diego, San Diego County mm -hmm. on, uh, on film scoring. And that's, um, that's my regular thing. And I, I love doing that every year. I usually do it this time of year in June. Wow. Uh, unfortunately, we're Not taking this year, year off. That's right. Of, yeah. 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 It'll be around for next year. So that's, that's what that is. It sounds fantastic. Well, Roger, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to have this chat, uh, taking time out of your schedule, and for just kind of filling us in on the work that you do and how you approach it. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It's been a pleasure talking with you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Many thanks to Roger for the great discussion. It was really cool to hear about how he approaches his work, and especially this idea of being able to manage so many different musical styles in a pretty adept way. Very interesting stuff. Um, I just want to let everybody know I'm going to uh, have to take a week off. My medical conditions uh, remain tenuous, and so I have uh, some more work to do on that. Uh, so next week, uh, there will not be a uh, podcast that would be on the 12th. But on the 19th, we've already got something lined up. So I will be talking to you in two weeks. Thank you so much for listening, and um, I'm going to let you go now. Have a good one. Bye.